Welcome to season three of Locker Room for Growers, a show with human-centric conversations that include compelling stories, unique professions, and those who set the tone for living with a positive attitude. I'm your host, Debbie Ellickson. Please subscribe to the show and check out our past episodes and clips. Follow me on YouTube, TikTok, Instagram, threads, and more. Now let's meet our next guest. Today, we're going to discuss the topic, controlling the cultural narrative. My guest is Geoff Hall, a director, screenwriter, and author from Bristol, United Kingdom. Hall has an interesting background that has shaped much of his creative work. He grew up playing on the same ground that once held a, w, a World War II prisoner of war camp for Italian soldiers. He has demonstrated against the persecution of people with alternate political viewpoints outside the Russian embassy. And it's safe to say that social responsibility is in Hall's DNA. One of his working projects is a psychological drama feature film about human trafficking against organized crime. Please welcome Geoff Hall. Hello, everyone. And thank you, Debbie. So this idea to have you on and, and talk about this topic was mm. triggered by that deadline article that I saw. <clears throat> where yeah. UK films and TV industries are being probed by a parliamentary committee on culture, mm. media, and sport. And of course, <clears throat> this is all going down during the SAG-AFTRA writers' yeah. strike. So Britain is a leading country for creative content. And also, I imagine the government invests quite a bit of money into the industry, but it opens up an interesting conversation based on this deadline article. How much control should governments have in our creative industries? Like we want them to support them, but on the other yeah. hand, how much control do we give them? Um, none. There you go. <laughs> that's end of conversation. Thank you, everybody. Um, that's me done. No, you've got to bear in mind that the BBC, Channel 4 and Channel 5 are state-owned, state-run. And therefore, tax dollars or pounds go into that. But, you know, they like to have a little leverage. But that whole thing about being probed, I mean, that word probe does not have a good connotation, does it? And that kind of drew my attention to it. But I understand that when they're talking about high-end TV and film production, actually, most of that high-end thing, it, it's an inward investment. So it's like Guardians of the Galaxy going to Elstree Studios or whatever, yes? Mm -hmm. There's a whole series of uh, studios that's been built around the UK to facilitate what, for me, is just inward investment. Now, the way I see it is that outside of that state controlled and straight state financed industry or aspect of the industry what you have is nothing more than a cottage industry because there are when i was trying to raise funds for seeing rachel which is the film you mentioned earlier it was really difficult to get anybody to understand what the film was about and in terms of support from all of those august bodies like Creative England, it just wasn't there. And nor was there any sense of where that, if you wanted private investment, where that would come from. So what you had was a situation, as I've said, it's a cottage industry where people with money who would like to invest in film don't know how to because they haven't been educated how to. So therein lies what is a kind of structural problem, you know, that there is very little means to attract high net worth individuals into investing in your film. It is really difficult. Now, it was already on a slump before we hit the pandemic. So you can imagine what happened with the pandemic 
It's mm-hmm. just gone down and down and down and down. And there has been no recovery in my mind from what I see over here. Uh, and I'm not an all seeing eye. So somebody might say oh, that's Kratchev. But hey, what we have is this failure of educating people with money to what to expect when they invest in a film and where where their return on investment might come from and that has not been addressed it's interesting that they're talking about probing this high-end production but they're not doing anything about grassroots investment and independent Mm -hmm. film so you don't have what we have in canada we have the canada council grant where I mean, it encompasses writers, podcasts, like just about every everything. But sure. the chances of getting it or like winning the lottery mm-hmm. does fund a lot of our publishing industry and a lot of our film industry where the government, you apply for the grant and yep. you, know, you jump yep. through all their hoops and then the mm-hmm. government gives you money. But it's not really something uh-huh. you can guarantee. No. Um, um, you have something like that across- there? Yeah, we have, you know, various bodies like we used to have the UK Film Council, which has kind of gone into Creative England and Creative UK. And part of the problem, we looked at getting a £200,000 grant for Seeing Rachel, which would have been, well, wouldn't have been the full budget, obviously. Mm -hmm. It would fall way short. But one of the first questions they asked was, well, who have you got? Who have you got signed? Who have you got attached to the film? And we're going, well, if you knew the business, you realize that if I have a script and say I wanted to give it to Ewan McGregor, I'd have to go through his agent. Yeah. Yes. The agent will say, okay, um, so this is fully, you know, fully funded. No, we don't have any money yet. Well, the answer to that is we're not going to show our talent that because then it raises their expectation and it puts more pressure on the agent to then maybe go and help find a little bit of money. And they don't want to do that. That's really not their their job. Isn't to find finance for the film. That's interesting because I don't see that. I've never applied for a film grant. I've applied for writing grants, but right there, as far as I know with, because the National Film Board gets a lot of funding through the Canada Council Grant. Right. A lot of these film festivals, they get money through Canada Council. But but I don't recall hearing or seeing anything that where they wanted the talent attached to it. It's usually mm-hmm, about mm-hmm. project, the quality of the project, your background as a creator, and why should they why does this topic matter to Canadians? That whole idea of trying to fit a market, that again belies the fact that they think they know about film yeah. and about film culture, but they don't. Because nobody expected Barbie to be, bang, massive hit. I bet when they looked at this script, they thought, oh, okay, it's Greta. They so just thought fine, another but... chick flick, right? But yeah. hey, chicks run the world right now. So indeed, they you do. Know. <laughs> Un- unless your name is uh, Oppenheimer. And, and so, that um, should be a note to creators, like you know, we or studios, you need more content like this. Yeah, and uh, I read uh, an article just a couple of days ago that said <clears throat> actually the the cinemas in the UK would like to follow up from the success of Oppenheimer and and, and Barbie. But there's not the product out there. There are not the films out there to fill the gap. So they've raised bullshit. this expectation. <laughs> uh, sorry, say that again. I think that's bullshit because we're both on stage 32 and there's more content than you could ever make in a lifetime. Yeah, but what they so mean by I, content... I call bullshit on that. <laughs> yeah, well, I would agree with you, except they don't mean us. They don't mean independent filmmakers. They mean their idea of an independent film is a low budget studio film. Yeah. Yeah. So you now we have this thing called studio indies and the whole thing. Peaky blinders. That would be the lower budget for them, right? (laughs) I don't know. I think that would have been quite an interesting thing to maybe change into a film, a feature film. I, I still go back to the fact that what they mean by content, big budget tentpole kind of things. Yeah. 
projects, big stories, you know. Guardians of the Galaxy 26 or yeah, Fast we and could Furious probably blame Marvel for this, right? Because Marvel's yeah. the one that absolutely set for it. that budget out of reach for most filmmakers. Yeah, yeah. You know, if you look at the the w, WGA and SAGAFRA stripes, you know, they're talking about a fair wage for their work. And yet on the other side of the table, there's Bob Iger of oh, Disney. Yeah. <laughs> now, Disney have just been, uh, I think they're up in the courts as a case against them from TSG, which is an entertainment group that finds finance for some of Disney's projects and some of 20th Century Fox and all of those kind of guys. So it's high finance. And they find that Disney have been cooking the books. Well, and plus they own Florida. There's that issue down in Florida, speaking of control. Yeah, when you're that big, when you, I mean, you knew when they bought Star Wars, nobody could touch them, right? They went from a minor studio to like multi-major studio mm. just with the addition of Marvel and Star Wars. So because those yes. films are just a license to print money, even if they're crappy, crappy versions yeah. of that yeah, yeah. series. Sure. But... And that is where the disconnect comes in, isn't it, Jeff? Because, like you say, the education aspect, because people who are watching the strike go on, they're thinking, mm. oh, well, you know, all these A-listers are on the picket line. Who cares? They're making money yeah. anyway. Well, right yeah. now they're not. Right now they're donating to... The various yeah, guys. and most of the creators, how what percentage would you say it would be? But I would say the A-listers are basically maybe not even 10% of the people who work oh. around the entire industry no, that less than. make that money, right? Everybody oh, else yeah. is like paycheck to paycheck, project to project, and hoping yeah. they can rent next month. But they probably still don't make out of a film what... Bob Iger or Ted Sarandos make each year oh, out God. of their, their corporate bonuses, you know, their executive. I think yeah. they called it corporate compensation. No, no, executive compensation. Yeah. And I'm going, hang on, compensation. It sounds like, you know, something's bad happened and they need to be compensated because they've had a rough passage of work or they've been somehow sanctioned or you know maybe that they've been prejudiced against them they've had to really fight for their craft but no you know they sit there and they cook the books and then they get this huge executive compensation thing and i'm going well <clears throat> you know i think many of us would be quite happy you know to to make from a film what bob Iger gets in his executive compensation yeah no year. shit <laughs> yeah no shit sherlock yes but you know, when you think back to the lockdown, it the the global lockdown from mm -hmm. COVID, that was when Marvel was releasing Black Widow. And let's yep. face it, Scarlett Johansson got screwed. And I think this is where <laughs> this all started. Because mm -hmm. back then it was all box office, but now we know, like, mm. especially even before COVID, streaming was where it was at. Netflix and Prime mm -hmm. and Disney. Disney, I don't think is is as big in the streaming market as as Prime and uh, Netflix, especially in Canada, because they don't really have a whole lot of content. But <clears throat> streaming, we can see. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket science. I could have told you this in two thousand twelve. Streaming is the future of. It's not that you're not going to go to the box office because I mean. I love the experience. You yeah, know, we're, we're still going to move physical movies. Sure. But let's face it, most of the stuff we watch is streamed on TV or on our mobile or whatever. For sure, for sure. And so when Black Widow came out and then they made, it was their excuse not to pay her what she should have been paid on right. the film compared yes. to every <clears throat> other Marvel. Mm -hmm. And you cannot tell me that Marvel didn't make more off that streaming, the initial streaming of Black Widow than they would have in the theater. You, you, you may be right, but how would you think that they made their money out of Black Widow streaming it? 
Are you talking about subscription? People had to pay VOD? like $30, $40 right. for... Oh, good grief. Then yes. Yeah, I yeah. agree with you. Yes. They yeah. had to pay. Yeah. And that was every Wonder Woman, all the streaming, all the new releases that came out during the pandemic. Yes. And even today, if you go to Cineplex, if you go to mm -hmm. Amazon, mm -hmm. and you want to stream one of the movies that just came out of the theater... Mm. It no longer costs you six ninety five or seven ninety five. No, it costs you upwards of forty dollars, and sometimes more, depending on the popularity mm. of the film, to stream that movie for the first. Well, hell, Wonder Woman stayed that cost for streaming for two years before they yeah. opened it up a little more. But you cannot tell me if you're charging four times more than a movie ticket for what it costs to stream, that the streaming revenue is a way more, but then even like, who knows with the free streaming, you know, or it's not, but, really free, but you yeah. know, with the other, I mean, it's but in, imagine if you got to the theater and you said two tickets and they said $60 or you're gonna 60 say, pounds. You're going to walk you're out. Gonna, you're going to walk out. So uh, the whole argument about the, the rise of streaming and bums on seats, as it were, is predicated upon the fact that, well, it's cheaper than going to the cinema. Yeah. But it's, it's in many cases, it's not. No, like even you said, if you add in the popcorn. <laughs> yeah, yeah, the concessions or whatever they're called, which are more expensive than the tickets that you pay to get in. True. But generally, you know, if uh, people were saying, oh, yes, but then there's the travel costs. And I'm going, well, OK, if I wanted to go into Bristol City Centre, it would cost me four pounds return ticket i have a bus four pass. pounds <laughs> oh so do i yes but uh i have i also have a senior rail card and i get 30 percent. yeah I, I pay for okay. the year right so yeah yeah so you know i i understand people feel that they don't want to be in a public space with potential of catching all sorts of ungodly kind of you know viruses but we did that before yeah and i think we'll do it after the pandemic so yeah. I don't think that theatrical is over and done with. And I know there are some people on stage 32 that would disagree with me, but um, it's a bit like saying, I don't know, CDs, that's the end of music. It wasn't. Mm. The, people won't buy them because they want LPs. Well, guess what happened? Them. Yeah. But they're more expensive because they're now specialized. Yeah. yeah. It's when I was a photographer, I loved using black and white infrared film. Mm. And it was affordable then. And that was your everyday kind of film costs versus, oh, digital. Wow, that cost an arm and a leg. So, but once the saturation of digital came about, guess what was seen as the specialist? It yeah. was the black and white negative, infrared negative film or the black and white negative film. So, you know, I, I was priced out of the market. I don't think I've used my, my camera since. I understand that the swings and there's roundabouts to everything, but economically, I think there's like you, there's still something about sitting in a dark room with a bunch of strangers. And a popcorn. I mean, popcorn, <laughs> I don't know, a Sprite or whatever, anything I can get that doesn't have caffeine and doesn't have sugar in, I'm fine with. I go there with my son. We went to see Oppenheimer. There's nothing like it. You're not There's telling me like yeah. that, that, that I have the same experience when I sit down in front of my TV screen to watch it on a streamer. I don't. Because guess what? When I'm in the theatre, I sit there and I watch. When yeah. I'm at home, I go, oh, I'm just going to get up. I'm going to go for a pee or I'm going to have a, another drink or I'm going to do this. Pause. Or, pause. You know, and pause. Go yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and that's that to me ruins it. Oppenheimer, you, know, you go to Planet, so okay, the, the credit, the next movie, <laughs> before the feature starts, you kind of have to map where the last two previews come on, so you can go to the bathroom quick, come back, so you can make it through the whole three hours. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But then what does it mean for a writer and sometimes filmmaker like me? I'm nowhere in the league of a budget that Oppenheimer would get or Barbie would get, you know, but it brings us back to the infrastructure 
in Britain isn't there to attract private investment to a great extent. Exactly. And same here. I mean, you know, you go to the films and all the ones mm -hmm. that aren't Marvel mm -hmm. and Star Wars. Yes. And yeah. The good ones. And yeah. Barbie. <laughs> all the ones that aren't the big blockbuster budgets, they might be in a theater. I don't even know if half of them stay for two weeks. If they get to the theater. Yeah. I, th th there is that. There's that great story about Ex Machina and A24. Now, yeah. Ex Machina was not a high budget in terms of American standards, but, you know, A24 have like, great strategies for distribution, don't they? I always think if I had a film release, I would want them to distribute it, you mm. know, because they are so imaginative and creative with what they do. Yeah. I read this article um, and it was about Ex Machina and also about independent film. And what happens you're, if you're lucky enough to get into one of the cinema chains, yeah, the theater, then you may find that you get a week at best. You know, if the first weekend doesn't bang the box office, then they start reducing the times that you can see that film. And of course, by the end of the week, they say, oh, we're not seeing any business for this. Well, who can afford, you know, in the working week to go and see a film at 1.30 in the afternoon? Yeah. Yeah. You Although see, I so... do. <laughs> that's my, that's usually my choice of because then I get the place to myself. <laughs> but you can see what, um, this is straying a little bit from controlling the cultural narrative, you know, but if you but go it's back part to. part of it, because if your film has uh, a slim and none chance of getting into a theater, how do people view it? Streaming. Mm. So how do you mm. get on the streaming platform? That's another yeah. topic, but. In a way, the studios kind of are in, like we are mentioned before, mm. you mentioned, mm. the studios kind of are in a little bit seemingly in cahoots with the governments or work around with the governments to, to fund the larger projects. But the other Grassroots cultural is... narrative comes from mm. the individual producers. The, the yeah, Indians. absolutely. That's the, really it, it's the indies that's that's but you see in a turn in terms they in a way they are controlling the narrative by not allowing it access to the public yeah yeah so let's that's talk a, a bit about thing. that other post that you had put on stage 32 about the major uk broadcasters and prime video pledging extra donations to uk's film and tv charity following an 800 percent rise in grant applications from workers yeah. struggling with the yeah. like, does how does that fit into this narrative or does it well i'm not sure it does i think it's just a sign the fact that in these state owned state run managed whatever you want to say entities then they have to be responsive to the market so there i think they're trying to support the creative community um, and I don't think that's a sense of um, controlling the cultural narrative. Yeah. I think that's just kind of support. Supporting I think, the um, cultural narrative. Yeah, supporting but their cultural narrative. <laughs> now, you see, if you yeah. go and you ask for these grants, there will be quotas. They will like look the at CRCT, your script. Yeah. Or the yeah, they'll say there are not enough black Canada. people in there. There are not enough Asians. There are not enough gay, lesbian or whatever people. There's not enough, you know whatever oh you know where's the young people or what so there's a there's a problem with that i would rather be just uh, let me write a story and i can put anybody in there that i want to but with that too you have black creators and other creators who who can't even get halfway through the door because of the prejudice i mean it, it's complex complex it's not a, it's very a simple... complex yeah problem but I, I i think what was more alarming was the story about saeed rusti the iranian filmmaker mm -hmm. that had an award-winning film leila's brothers at Cannes, and he gets back home and he's arrested because he refused to correct the film yeah hmm um, so we're talking about controlling the cultural narrative there. Oh, my goodness. That's probably a, a little less subtle than what we are talking about here. But it's this kind of thing with 
state controlled propaganda, as I would call it, is, is just insidious because you, you've created this atmosphere whereby the government needs to dictate what you, the kind of film you need to say. Like you said, oh, right, okay. Uh, so how does this film appeal to the audience? Well, well now oh. that you've opened up the door for my next Okay, go <laughs> point, on then. You totally opened this door, thank you. What a, <laughs> what a great bridge. In yes. Canada, the CRTC, yeah. which is the Canadian Radio, Televisions and Telecommunications yeah. Commission, yeah, yeah. has had an ironclad control over the media landscape mm. since yeah. I was born. It sets the rules on what the media can broadcast in the sense that mm. at least 50 to 55% of all the content has to be Canadian content. Okay. In their mix, especially with music. So on radio play, but, you heard yeah, a lot that's... of Canadian artists and the rest would be mixed with British, whatever, yeah. whatever that's, was on the top. Yeah, that's yeah. similar to what happens in France. And then on top of that, it intercepts major events like the Super Bowl, which is mm -hmm. probably <laughs> the largest viewing audience on the planet. The Super Bowl commercials are as big an event as the game itself. Yes. I've noticed. But in Canada, we cannot watch them because the CRTC has intercepted yeah, the yeah. switch over to Canadian content commercials that seem to run on a loop, like the same commercial over and over again. Yeah, sure. Um, and so that is really strong control of the canary. I mean, I get that you want to promote your own content yeah. but sometimes it, interferes with what's out there right sure in um terms of the uk showing the super bowl or american football you do get uh especially when it's live not so much edited kind of highlights but when it's live you get what's going to be a break in the continuity of the sport you're going to get an ad break in america and all they do in the bbc they don't allow those adverts because they're not licensed to actually show those those ads in the uk so what they just cut to the commentators and then straight back ad break over straight back onto the field part of it is to do with licensing it's a kind of interesting conundrum isn't it where we're on the world wide web even mm -hmm. now people send me links from the us and say oh look at this trailer for this and you can't watch it sorry you can't watch it yeah you same know? here you're in the wrong territory you know well, um, right now thinking, we can't even see Canadian news on Facebook or yeah, Meta yeah. because face and that like one side wants to blame the government for that, but the government's trying to do the right thing f to save hmm. the media because basically Meta and all these platforms have they take all the advertising money and keep it for hmm. themselves. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. meanwhile, all the sharing that happens with all these media companies. They don't get any advertising money from it that no. these platforms advertise their content. Canada isn't the first country that's done this. Oh, no. Australia no, no. did it. And Australia, they had go, gone through a ban too. But then mm -hmm. it reversed itself. And then finally, Australia is getting some money yes. for their media yes. companies. Yeah. <clears throat> it seems like it's just like the SAG after writer's strike here. It's like, we're going to hold our feet to the fire and, and mm -hmm, we're mm -hmm. not budging, you know? <laughs> no, but uh, I mean, part of it was to do with news feeds, wasn't it as well? Yeah, yeah. And, and now it's mostly know, everything that we share that comes from Canada. Well, I can quite see the article says, oh, well, you can see them pulling out altogether from offering news on their channels, on their sites. But I looked at it the other way and thought, well, I can quite see them having their own little news channels. Well, they Create do. Their own I mean, news. they do. I mean, you can access. That's a whole thing, too, is you can access. Although we can access a video like Google hasn't blocked everything. So you can access any media, even even let's face it, NBC. We, we can't watch NBC live on our computers. But if you have a VPN, you can watch. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Uh, however, you know, you can watch it on TV record it when it comes on tv you can go to al jazeera was blocked at one point from our cable but you could sure. go online and watch it live 
you can go on CBC's website. You can what you can stream it live if mm -hmm. you don't have cable. You can find mm. clips. You can find it anywhere. So you can go directly to their websites. Yes, but where it's the community aspect of sharing. But how many people stay on top of the news, or they wait to see it in their feed and say, "Oh, that's I didn't know about that story," mm. and then they jump into. Uh, to maybe look further into whatever it is. So that's yeah. basically the whole thing about it because Facebook is still, whether we like it or not, it's still the number one platform in the world. And that's where you got to be. If you want your content shared there, even mm. if you mm. have a page or anything, the algorithms kind of, you're not really being seen by anybody in your network, so to speak, but so it's really hard to uh, optimize. But still, if you're not there, no, I, it's tough because that's where I, everybody lives. <laughs> well, I, I th the thing is, I, we're so used to having... And they want to ban TikTok and that's where everybody yes. else lives. <laughs> we, we're used to kind of static forms, aren't yeah. we? Of these are the networks, these are the channels. This is when you can see Starsky and Hutch or this is when you can see person of interest or this is where you can see whatever whatever age you're from, whereas now it's a very kind of fluid form. It's the old static nature of showing content has gone, which is good, but it's also the whole field is fragmented. So yeah. people keep saying to me, oh, have you seen this? Have you seen, you know, yeah, it that, is. that's on Hulu or that's on whatever. I don't have that. I'm not going to pay. If I did that to cover myself, everything I wanted to watch, it would cost me an arm and a leg. Yeah, every streaming each platform month. you'd have to buy. Yeah, <laughs> which is ridiculous because you must be reducing the amount of viewers that you get, even though you can boast like Netflix is 220 million subscribers. It's still got the most content, though, which is why, which yeah. right? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'd say Prime is second for content library. Mm. And then whatever what isn't in their content library, you can usually pay like, a rent yes or you can rent it on youtube i've rented movies on youtube uh, right not uh, cineplex no. i've rent movies on cineplex uh, right. especially the ones that have just come off the theater that i just mm -hmm, missed. Mm -hmm. um but yeah it's fragmented but when it comes to news media that is mm -hmm. so dangerous uh, well we already know meta has been <laughs> the reason you know that government you know for the rise of autocracy because of yes you know cambridge cambridge analytica that's all you have to say they yes. were yeah explicit uh in that so for them to go this route is dangerous yes it sets a terrible precedent especially when we know what's going on with owner the of the platform that used to be twitter you have these the porters of autocracy trying to control mm. the news media that is an entertainment content it isn't film and film and television news. but it's an important part of our cultural narrative because mm. uh, what but does the news is yes. but the news is already controlled by huge entities <laughs> yes huge entities yeah sure you know <laughs> shareholders <laughs> or if it's yeah. state-owned television it's the state that runs it yeah. there are certain stories you can run there's certain ones you can't so I guess you know, so, the workaround so, from controlling the narrative or having this control over the cultural narratives, whether it's mm, media, entertainment, mm -hmm. no matter what, is doing what a lot of us are doing. Go the podcast route, discuss yeah. issues, release your movie on other streaming platforms. Like we see a lot of the smaller films, they're pay-per-view, but they're reasonably priced pay-per-view on mm -hmm. some of the like prime and hulu yeah. whatever yeah. so you can stream them so there's those options so that is and if somebody wants to see that you have to kind of go out of your way sometimes to see stuff mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. again it all depends on how good you are at marketing too right so oh for sure i think that is important we won't get that. into I... sports sports is another no. Probably no, no. another podcast because yeah, there's yeah. some issues in that too. But, but you know, because of my writing, I wrote a novel 
Um, it was released a couple of years ago. It's called Owl Believe. Okay. And it's uh, a dystopian kind of nightmarish world of an oppressive regime, but it's actually a, an oppressive regime run by corporate entities. Mm. Yeah. Which is so what corporatis we've got. <laughs> corporatism as government. Um, so somebody said to me, oh, well, this is not really future proof. And this is, this is now, this is, you're not projecting anything there. You're not telling us anything we don't know. And I go, well, I think maybe you have. And then, um, bless me, of course, I should have known that writing a novel about corporatism and government and control would lead to Amazon Kindle deleting my book and confiscating no, all the really? royalties. Yes, and confiscating all the royalties. Get the hell out. I know, that's what I said. And as my publisher said, you can't argue with a, an algorithm. And that was the end of that. So I lost the royalties. I've lost all the great reviews that I had in there. Everything. Six okay. months afterwards, it was all gone. So you talk about controlling a narrative. You know, I consider that as part of the control. Absolutely. I don't know whether you've read any books about propaganda. Oh, I've probably read a few. <laughs> I was reading, well, a while ago now, Edward Bernays book, Propaganda. It was published in 1928. And it is perceptive about the manipulation of the masses. We were given suffrage. We were allowed to, allowed to vote. Right. Of course, no, men before women, of course. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but then they had to find a means of controlling that. So they used propaganda to, to get us to vote for their interests. Yes. Not ours. Yeah. So democracy, meaning voice of the people, it, it's just a lie. In that but isn't respect. That, that capitalism too? <laughs> well, capitalism, corporatism, everything yeah. seems to be feeding into the political economy, if you want to call it that. I've got a little quote here, if you don't mind me reading it, which yeah. I thought it was just so telling. So this is the book called Propaganda by Edward Bernays. And the first chapter is called Organizing Chaos. That should give you a little bit of a what do they mean by that? So he goes on, Bernays says, the conscious and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Really? Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government, mm -hmm. which is the true ruling power of our country, or I would say, any country because he's writing about america yeah you have manipulation in the same way of talking about in the same sentence as democratic society so basically they are maneuvering us to vote for their interests these things we think of propaganda as kind of like fake news it's not fake news propaganda you know has to ring true it has to ring true, though, to your fears. Yeah. Yes. So I was reading another book on propaganda by Jacques Ellul, a sociologist, and he called it that propaganda is a total environment. It's unceasing because as soon as they break that kind of uh, transmission of propaganda, people wake up. Oh, mm -hmm. now you think about how the masses as Bernays calls us, have been manipulated. What issues would you think? Well, you we can go back to had... old Hollywood about that, right? Because we've got the McCarthyism where Hollywood movies, there are great filmmakers and actors and people in the industry who were blacklisted because yeah. they were suspected. Yeah, yeah. Well, Oppenheimer. Oppenheimer is... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, there we go. Let's just it, bring it right it's to that. right inside the movie they talk about it because he has to go through this McCarthyism mm, board, mm, yeah. being accused of being a communist, whatever that yeah. means, and yes. and then they get but the Hollywood people got blacklisted and absolutely mm -hmm. yeah terrorized over that by the government. So it's that is like ultimate control over the cultural narrative, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, it, it continues during wartime, you know? You, yeah, you, and then you know? it kind of renaissances a bit 
after that, but it's so interesting. I don't know what the solution is because, but I think that some of it might come out of this strike because they, I'm, I'm so glad so. nobody's giving in on the creative side yet. So uh, no, no. Um, and the, the latest news was that the meeting together had gone badly. Um, well, that's not a surprise. <laughs> so for me, the answer is that f writers are free, free to write what they want, not with any state, state diktat. Yeah. It's free, you know, but the thing is beyond writing, it has to be produced. There's no point me keeping that and filing it. And this is where the it. producers, this is where the strike comes in, because if you can't produce your work, it just sits in mm. your computer. Yeah. And that's, it's not a good feeling. It's not no. a good feeling. Because but even think... if you try to say you've got your screenplay and mm. so you walk around the house with your smartphone yeah, and yeah. decide to like film a really low, mm -mm. low, 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 low budget yeah. version of it. Yeah, and yeah. You can't hold the phone or whatever and you act it out. Sure. Um, that's going against the strike. That's that's like crossing the picket line. I say, yeah. especially if yeah. you upload that content and try to market it. That's basically shitting all over these people that are yeah. sacrificing. But you see, Mark Ruffalo was saying, well, let's, okay, forget about the studios. Let's do indie. Well, well I agree with okay, you. Okay, Mr. Ruffalo. Yeah, I agree with you, but come on, let's do it. We can't do it. Like... You know, like it doesn't solve the strike though. No, it doesn't solve the strike, but... I think the problem is there's almost a, too much of a reliance on the studios yeah. for, for film production. We but have we to need... wean ourselves off that and yeah. start really pulling together a, a very strong, independent culture of film yeah. with investors, but I also agree. with the creative community. So it's it, reciprocity. You know, the reciprocity comes from for an investor with the creatives when they get the return on investment. And then we have to pull the cinemas in on this. Yeah. Because right now the studios seem to own the cinemas. Yes, which remember years ago that was banned, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, and if you don't have the cinemas, if you, I mean, if you're a local writer, say, I mean, okay, I'm Calgary. I'm, and in Canada, we have Cineplex is one of the largest chains for yeah. movie theaters, especially with the IMAX. And so say I write this script, which is a tall ask right now anyway. But anyway, mm -hmm. say I write this script and uh, get it produced. And, you know, I fund it and and find find the even if it just shows at the West Hills over here um, mm -hmm. at this theater and local you know you can promote it have an event yes. about all yeah. around you know circulate yeah yeah I'm releasing this film today come to the event blah 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 I mean that would be great but you can rent out although cinema Cineplex will let you rent out of theater right yes but. They probably wouldn't do that to air your film even for a week, right? No, it would be a special showing. You yeah. might be able to get, you know, a screen for a premiere, but then don't expect them to say, oh, right. Let's yeah, carry they're this not going to carry it. It's not like going to a bookstore and talking with the bookstore manager yeah. and saying, the... I live in the neighbor. I'm a neighborhood writer yeah. and i just wrote this book maybe it's something if you want to why don't you try you know try and convince him to like put it on the shelf mm. even a couple yes. of days to yeah, see yeah. if anybody looks at it yeah 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 you could do that in a bookstore but you can't do that in a theater <laughs> no 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 because they would say well we're losing res revenue although in the bookstore you could have a book signing if they already carry one of the books um, oh, in Bristol, you can have a book signing of your own book. They don't have to carry it, but okay. you then have to go to their till to buy it. So, yes, so yes. So yeah, they you can do that a little bit too. Of a yeah. yeah, so they get the higher fee and then they maybe get a little bit from the sale. Yeah. Which but is, I think you know, that would fine. be, but if it movie-wise, that would be a really great thing for independent artists. Especially you could go it to depends your depends on this depends on the scale of it. Depends but on the it, scale even of it. Though, just doesn't it? start it out locally and then you can get some reviews. And then you could like 
morph it out from there because it's, cause one of the things of marketing is that it's already out there. I'm just reaching, but the, there's the, the, probably a lot more people that are smarter than me that have uh, bigger ideas pro probably out on that picket line to yes. help solve some of these issues. But as, but we sure. also want to solve, like Mark Ruffalo, you want it to also include all the small independents. Sure. And, 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 and part of the problem with getting it out there is creating awareness of it because we don't have the the budgets of warner brothers no or or any of the studios or any of the streamers we're not even anywhere close to that so it's how you i think that i i read something about you know indie cinema what it should be doing is is creating an event yeah scenario for the film and then the, the event becomes memorable there's another guy that I love uh, to read was called Gaston Bachelard. He wrote a book called The Poetics of Space. And he said, you know, you have to touch the depths before you break the surface. I love that. And that is probably a really great quote to end this broadcast with. Thank you so much. No, thank you. This is Debbie Ellickson. Thank you to my guest and to you, the viewer, for watching this episode of Locker Room for Growth. Please subscribe to this channel and check out our past shows and clips in the YouTube playlist. The show broadcasts from Treaty 7 on Turtle Island, the traditional territory of the Blackfoot people, which includes Siksida, Blood, Pikani, Sutina, Stony Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation Region 3. Again, thank you for watching and please subscribe.